Good morning. Good morning. I'm here today with State Representative Linda Bebko Jones, who represents the first legislative district from Erie County. She was seated in 1993 and is currently serving this 2006 legislative session. Thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for having me, Holly. I'm Heidi. It's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. But no, don't. Um, I wanted to begin by, ask, by dis asking you to describe your childhood and your early family life and how that prepared you for public service. Well, I came from a very political family. Even though when I was little, I didn't know it was a political family. My dad was a committee person in my legislative district, and he was always campaigning for someone. And he would send me out in my wagon with flyers and just say, you know, you put these in doors, not mailboxes. He was real oh, adamant about that. And he would just say, uh, this is a man or this is a woman that can really help the people in our district. And that's how I, you know, really began, not knowing what I was really doing, but handing these flyers in people's doors. And as I got older, you know, I realized that uh, my dad was really... Um, involved with the community. It was, you know, in the old days when committee people, uh, they really took their job seriously. You know, my dad would go to all the homes in the district, see what people needed and tried to help. And that's how my dad has been my role model. And I came from a family of six. And uh, for some reason, I was the one that really got into this. Well, why did you decide the Democratic Party? I always joke with people that, you know, I'm also a Catholic, that when uh, I got baptized, right after I got baptized, there was this other fountain in the church, and I automatically became a Democrat. <laughs> there was just no doubt. and. Because a as I grew up, I, I realized the difference between the two parties. And I know what my dad was doing was just so incredible that you had to be a Democrat in order to push those issues and, and do what he did. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about your career before coming to the House and how did that uh, impact your role as a legislator? Well, I had the opportunity to work for a U.S. Senator and a state senator. So I've actually been in state government for 24 years. And uh, I was the first woman elected to this seat, the first legislative seat. And I, I came from the social work side. Uh, before I got elected, I was a drug and alcohol counselor, and um, my goals were just always focused on social issues. So after, you know, working for two senators, I decided that you can be an advocate for issues for so long. And in order to really make a difference, you needed to be at the table. So I decided, hey, goodbye, guys. I'm doing it now. That's how uh, I ended up running for this office. So, so how did you become personally involved? What motivated you to run? Um, I think probably the drug and alcohol issue. Uh, I had firsthand uh, the difficulties especially women were having, and especially if they were making that transition from maybe prison. Most women were incarcerated because of bad checks. It wasn't anything uh, violent. And we have several different uh, homes in, in my district that deal with women and children. Erie was one of the first to have one of these homes where they could take their children, you know, with them. And I'm a recovering alcoholic of 26 years. So 
that issue uh, just brought me here to say if I'm going to make a difference and I'm going to fight for more funding and more programs, I need to be at the table. So I think every legislator, when they're running, there's, there's some issue that brings them to that point. You know, whether it's economic development, um, the environment, something. And in my situation, it was drug and alcohol. Could you describe your first campaign? Oy, oy. <laughs> I lost my first election. Uh, it was an open seat. The incumbent had um, retired, and a former police officer was running, and he had run against the incumbent the term before. But being that uh, it was an open seat after that, I, I couldn't. I couldn't resist. I could, there was an opportunity. Uh, I ran with five men on the Democratic side and one man on the Republican side. And it was really difficult, uh, that first election. I was looked upon, and even from women, you know, why do you want to do this? This is a man's job. And the more I heard that, the more angrier I got, the more I was going to prove a point. So, uh, Unlike men, uh, during that election, any debates, any anything, you know, the media would focus on, you know, what their goals were and so forth. With me, do you know you have a runner in your nylon? Yes. Now, this was back in 1990. It, it, it just was bizarre. It was just bizarre. But with all those Democrats in the race, we kind of thought third, maybe, or last. And uh, we, we made it to second. So we were just so excited. And that night, everyone, that's where the LBJ came in. Uh, everyone was screaming all the way with LBJ, and they're pouring champagne, and the media says, Linda, do you know you lost? <laughs> and I go, yeah, but we didn't. This is my first run, all these candidates. I said, we're really happy about it. So what about the second time around? The se after that loss, there was no way I was going to do this again <laughs> in my mind. No way uh, because of everything that happened in that campaign. But then the incumbent, he just wasn't doing his job. And I had more and more people calling me and tell me, Linda, you have to do it again. Linda, you have to do it again. I said, no, I'm not doing it again. I'm not going through that. And my husband, one day I came home and he said, I think you should do this. I said, are you crazy? After what we went through, and he says, yeah, but I think you can beat him one-on-one. -on -one. That was in the primary. Fifty-seven votes, and here I am. What were those two campaigns different from subsequent campaigns? Uh, pretty much the same. <laughs> um, in the primary, you know, I'd be out on the streets and, I'd be telling people what my goals were, what I wanted to do, and people would say, oh, Linda, I've seen you on TV. You got your hair cut. Okay. They like my new haircut. Uh, what was I talking about? Oh, I don't know. But, you know, another thing is, don't wear red lipstick. We don't like you with red lipstick. That was in the primary. We worked 24-7, even I went door to door election day, I didn't stop. And 57 votes. And then the primary was another difficult because the same Republican ran the same time I did. 
and he ran a very, very negative, you know, race against me. He, um, there, there was this uh, debate about having a abortion clinic uh, in my district, and his prime targets were the only business that I'm going to bring to my district is this clinic, because I'm pro-choice. He was pro-life. And it was brutal. But I beat him by a thousand votes. So that was it. Uh, the, the rest is history. And any Republican that ran against me, you know, I cleaned up. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to get to that in a second. Okay. Um, how much money did you have to raise in your first campaign? And do you know what you had to raise in your last campaign? And did it go up exponentially? You know, being a first timer, it was it was just amazing. Um, I had a friend who's in her late forties. She came from a political family, but they were very hurt on election. Said she'll never vote again. Da 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 da. She said the only time I'm going to vote, Linda, is if you run for office. So I gave her her little card. I said I'm running for office. Uh, my volunteers were my family, elected officials, a lot of constituents that, and I, and I believe it was maybe $20,000 uh, because we did have to pay for some things. I had like elected officials, we had a uh, pizza party. My mother made all the pizzas, and we had boxes, if you could get them, baked or unbaked. And if they were baked, an elected official delivered it to your house, and on the, the box it said, LBJ delivers. So it, it, it was a fun thing because most of the people involved in my first campaign were people who were never, ever involved before. And they realized what it cost and what you need to do. If it wasn't for my mother lending me the money every time I turned around, go, Mom, I have to do one more mailing, just one more mailing, you know. So it, it was scary because that's why I was surprised my husband wanted to do it again because we did have debts from that first election. And when we decided, okay, I'll do this again, I can honestly tell you that if I would have lost that election, we probably would have been living in public housing because we maxed out. Because, again, you're running against an incumbent. We maxed out all our credit cards. It's very difficult to get any contributions when you're running uh, against an incumbent. And, uh, but one of the things I tell people when I'm recruiting them for this office is, number one, if you cannot invest in yourself, why should I invest in you? And number two, it has to be in your gut, your heart, and your head that you truly believe that if you come down here, you can make a difference. It doesn't matter if it's a big difference or a little difference. But if you don't have that, if you're just running because you woke up in the morning, said, gee, I think I'll be a state rep, you're not going to have that adrenaline pushing. And for that election, it was both, very scary for me and my husband because we knew what the end result would be if I lost and it would have been really tragic, really tragic. Well, I had done a little bit of research on your district and I think it's been a hundred years since a Republican has held your yes. seat. 85, I believe, yeah. somewhere around there. So yeah. I'd say you probably have a, a lock, at least the Democratic it's, Party has yeah. a lock on your seat. Yes, yeah, so far, you know, we do. It's like um, three to one. 
and within the last couple of years, my districts has changed quite a bit. Uh, I have a great deal of Latinos and African Americans, uh, Hispanics. Uh, it, it used to be just a Polish district, and then after redistricting, that kind of changed too. But um, and everyone, the my first time around, well, you're not Polish. You don't have. SKI. I mean, if you were not a Polish person, you wouldn't. You don't even think of running for this district. But I am Polish and I am Slovak. My mother was Soboleski. Now, to put all these names, uh, we felt, God, people are going to think I was married and divorced 20 times. So we, what I did was, I did a column in our local newspaper uh, every week talking about my Polish heritage so that people would know that I am Polish. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit more about your district. Can you describe uh, the people and their issues, the geography, and uh, this, what, what makes the first legislative district tick, really? Well. I consider my district as kind of a poor district. Maybe the average income is about 35000 I have a lot of refugees in my district, and their big concerns, uh, obviously, is, you know, getting jobs, housing, and health care. Uh, I always looked at my district as my extended family because no matter where I went, I could be at a red light and they stop me and so forth. And I think, you know, that's because I've always been accessible. You know, they come to my house, they come wherever they can find me, they find me. And those are really the the issues. Uh, with my constituents and my seniors with the PACE program and the rent rebate and now we have the new Medicare laws. I mean, we have to help them. Uh, a lot of my district are widows and these women never wrote a paycheck in their life, never paid a bill in their life. All of a sudden their spouse dies and I mean, they'll come in the office with paper bags you know, with just all this paper. And I've had the best staff in the world, the best staff. They've been with me uh, all 14 years, and uh, no one has worked harder than my staff, mm -hmm. and I drive them crazy, <laughs> believe me. Did you do any um, special projects back in your district? Let's see. We had... Um, when the CHIP program first was available, we held two sign-ups, you know, for people to come in the office. Most of my folks don't even have automobiles. And my office has been on a bus uh, route. They can get off right in front of my office. The lift program also will drop them off. And so they, I look at some of them today and, you know, I'm happy and I'm sad because they're sad that I'm leaving. They're concerned that uh, who's going to do all this, you know, for them. But uh, so we launched that program to get, because most of my constituents had no clue. You know, moms, single moms were working two part-time jobs, no benefits for either herself or her children. So when this program began, we partnered with uh, Blue Cross and we did an afternoon of sign-ups and an evening of sign-ups. Um. Can I ask you uh, about 
You also ran for mayor, I think. Yeah, um, while I While I'm talking about it campaigns was... and <laughs> what was that like? Because and again, there were like the fourth largest city. Isn't yeah, it? Uh, a, there again was uh, six Democratic candidates. Now, if you recall, the the present mayor was under indictment, and my sister, who is now passed, she always always wanted me to run for me. And I thought about it, thought about it. I said, I have nothing to lose. I just got out of running and got reelected, you know. If I lose the mayor's race, I still am a state rep. And my goal was, I think, when I looked at all this, I wouldn't have to travel to Harrisburg anymore, I would be at home. But then as the mayor, you're really under a microscope uh, every single day. As a state rep from Erie, uh, my constituents know that I'm here in Harrisburg from Sunday to Wednesday, sometimes Thursday. So you don't get those hits. Even though we do interviews from here, it's not the same as doing it uh, for mayor. And I enjoyed it. I really did. Uh, the present mayor and I uh, worked very well together. It was a fun thing dealing with all these guys and all the debates and so forth. And I did beat the uh, indicted mayor because he decides he's going to run anyway. So I kind of felt good about that one. <laughs> Well, could you talk a little bit about your relationship with the Erie County delegates? <laughs> it has been a wonderful relationship. And I know you hear on the federal level how we're all going to work together, forget about partisanship. But in the Erie delegation, uh, we truly have. And this last term, uh, I was, the, the guys named me the deanus. We always had a dean of the delegation, and that goes according to seniority. So when I had the seniority, then the guys decided, you know, okay, now we have a deanus. The Northwest has always, if it had something to do in Matthew Good's district, John Evans' district, Kurt Sonny's district, and even though they're Republicans, we would sit down, we'd have monthly meetings, and look at the big picture of how this is going to benefit northwestern Pennsylvania, not just me as a state rep. And obviously there were issues we didn't agree on, we didn't even touch them. But when it came to the city of Erie, the county of Erie, we work very well on different projects, just like with our uh, casino that's going to be uh, up and running pretty soon, and that's not in my district, but all of us work very hard to get that casino in northwestern Pennsylvania. Well, you did talk about whenever you were thinking about maybe being mayor, how it would be nice to be at home. Yeah. You are the furthest away from Harrisburg Absolutely. as a representative. Yes, six-hour drive. And that's the only thing I'm not going to miss. And there's not too many ways to get here. And a couple years ago, I slid on uh, black ice and ended up in a ravine. And it was very scary. And uh, I started after that taking a staff person with me, and I told them, you know, you're going to come with me because I don't want to die alone. They said, oh, that makes me feel good. Uh, and so, you know, that, that has worked out very well. And even to this day, and that happened two years ago, every t I want to put my political sign on the place where my car went into the ravine. You know how you see the crosses and the flowers and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And even today, every time I go by there, I just like cringe. Mm -hmm. I cringe. 
and to fly from Erie uh, to Harrisburg is ridiculous. It's 400 and some dollars one way. We no longer have that direct flight. We sit in Pittsburgh and I have control. When I'm driving, I have control of what I'm going to get here. When I'm flying, I don't have no control whatsoever. So, and I just felt it was very unfair to charge the taxpayers for flying. I mean, they elected me to do my job. They didn't elect me to uh, make it easier for me. Whenever you were first elected, did anything surprise you whenever you came to the Capitol? Well, you know what's funny is when I won, a lot of people said to me, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake for you because you work for a state senator, you know the system, da, 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 da. and I said, yeah, probably is. But when I got down here, it was a total different role. And it took me probably a good year to get out of my staff mode to legislative. I think one thing I can say as I end my career is that I always remained in that staff role. I, you know, how you always hear, uh, don't forget where you came from, and I never did. Uh, I can honestly tell you when I'm sitting here with you, I still can't believe that I am a state rep. You know. As I said to you earlier, I was um, one of six kids. My father had a bar. One of my jobs every day before I went to school, because like our house was here, the bar was here, and my grade school was here. Well, I had to go in every morning and sweep the floors, wipe the tables, all that stuff. Then I'd go to school. And as you know, a young kid, and I'm just looking at all these different bottles of booze up there. I thought this would be kind of neat. I got one of these big glasses and put a little bit of every kind, and I drank it down and went to school. And so I thought I was the happiest kid in town. But as years went by, I found out, you know, I was not. But uh, what else? Um, you were talking about remembering that you were always a staffer. Yes. I think I did, one of the things I committed to when I came down here was I am not going to treat staff like I was treated sometimes. So the first thing I did when I came down here every day I would meet a staff person from the caucus, go to their office, find out what they did, so I could put a face to the name. Because, you know, you have your writers, you have your researchers, you have all those folks. And I have always, uh, everybody comes to my office, all the staff come to my office, sit in my lounge and we talk and and so forth and they're just you know without them we're nothing and their information better be correct because we go out there and we quote all this stuff and if it's bad so I found by doing that especially like writers you know they have about six or seven legislators that they're responsible for. So I found after a while, like if they have a pile of stuff like this for legislators, and mine might be in the middle, or even on the bottom, all of a sudden it comes on the top. Just because you formed those relationships, and just because I, of me coming from a staff perspective, that uh, that happened. And I'm going to miss them so, so much because, you know, 
you get to be personal with them, their families. We've lost some staff members. They have lost their families, and we're just like a family when that occurs. We're, we're there for them, and that's how it should be. On a personal note, you were the only representative that wrote me a welcome to the house whenever I first and, started. <laughs> and, <Thank> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was another thing. Uh, you know, like we have staff awards once a year, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever. I al always have written personal notes and thanking them for their work. And they all had said to me, they have never, ever gotten a note from a member. And I said, you have to be kidding me. For 35 years of service, not even leadership. You know, they have the luncheon and so forth. But um, I, 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 especially someone with 35 years, and you're not going to thank them for what they did. And I was just, and, and I think that was part of my staff thing, too. Mm -hmm. You know, all of us would do certain things. And everyone wants to be recognized. Everybody wants to be welcomed into a new organization because there's a lot of anxiety there. You don't know what to expect. So you get a couple cards welcoming you. You kind of say, you know what? There might be an opportunity that I can meet her and we can get to communicate and I can find out more of what you do and you can find out more of what I do. And it kind of eases that anxiety. Because I remember as a staff person, uh, 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 you know, you just, I don't know if I can do this, I don't know. Because everything is unknown to you. And if you don't have some support coming from somewhere, you're just going to say, you know, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. Well, I wanted to get back to some of my pre pre uh, written questions. Can you talk about how you felt on your first swearing in ceremony? It was overwhelming, and I wished that my dad was alive to see it, and he wasn't. And we had a bus. I called it the bus from hell because everybody was just so excited, so we got this big bus. And my volunteers and all of us came down. And to this day, and I gave my going away speech just before we left for election, and I had said, every day that I sit in that seat, I am in awe. Even though I've been sitting there for 14 years, I'm in awe. Because if someone would have asked me, 30 years ago that, oh, you're going to be a state rep. I would have been sitting at a bar, falling off a bar stool, saying, oh, yeah, buddy, and I'll be president too someday. It just was awesome. And every day, I just look at William Penn, and I just say, but you never thought, never thought a woman would be sitting in this seat. So that feeling is still there with me. You know, even though I have one more week, uh, I still do the same thing. Uh, go in my seat, and I'm in total awe of this institution. Did you have any mentors whenever you first started? There weren't that many around because and mainly... Uh, you know, for a state position, they were all men. And, you know, it was, okay, honey, you won't be a little state rep. My mentors, when I first was getting serious about this, was former Mayor Joyce Savacchio and former County Executive Judy Lynch and Judge Stephanie Dimitrovich. Because in 1992, they were the first women on a local level to win and to really do a push on having women running for public office. So 
They were incredible mentors to me, and they still are. They still are. Even two are retired. You know, one's a judge. But, you know, like I said, my dad was always my inspiration. But when you talk about, you know, mentors and and in, in this position, those three ladies were were it. What was it like to be a freshman member? Oh, it was so wild. And I'm I'm a very organized person. Okay, and I found out <coughs> I wasn't here too long that if I don't learn to be flexible, this ain't going to work, okay? And that's both in my district office and in my Harris Bar office. You know, you have your schedule, okay? And I'm one of these persons, okay, everything that's on my schedule for that day, I do. Check it off, check it off, throw it away, okay? I get down here. There ain't no schedule. There ain't no time. There ain't nothing, okay? So I think that was the hardest thing is if you are not flexible, you're never going to last here because everything changes. And I think you know that just when we're in session and we're, okay, we'll be back on the house floor at 3 and we're back at 7, okay? So uh, I think that was one of the toughest things for me to get adjusted to because I'm one of these. Da, 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 da. How were you treated as a female member? Well, it was funny. The, guy, the incumbent that I, I uh, beat, as I told you, was a former, he was an undercover police officer, okay? And he was a big guy, big guy. <laughs> And I come down here, the guys thought, I must be this, whoa, I beat this police officer. So they're kind of looking for this big person. And I come down here, and they go, you beat Ken? I said, yeah, you got a problem with that? <laughs> no, we just thought you were bigger. On the day that I got sworn in, there were like seven cushions in my seat. I said, well, isn't this interesting? And they were trying to prove a point so I could see over my desk and see the speaker. I said, okay, fine. I'm not elected yet. I'm not legally sworn in. So after I was legally sworn in, I took one cushion and the other, and threw them right in the hall there on the house floor. And I went up to them and I said, look, I'm going to tell you something. I worked as hard as you did to get down here. Maybe even harder. The party's over. And that was one of the first things. Then the guys would, you know, pat me on the head and they go, now, you just listen, and you'll learn. You have any questions? And I go, oh boy. So, because they thought any woman that won in 1992, they were lucky. They just happened to win. It was a fluke that, because that was the biggest year. That was the year of the woman. That year, I had the biggest class. So. I said, okay, we're going to play this game. So I would come in, and I'd have my suit, and I'd wear these blouses and little bows on them, you know. So after I had the feel of the land, who's who, what kind of district they represent, and why I might be angry with their votes on something, you know, after I learned, you know, all of that, then all hell broke loose. <laughs> After six months, the the bow uh, blouses came off, and I can tell you, I've never had a problem since. And uh, they call me some choice words down here, but I know they mean it in love. Uh, my job is not to pacify leadership 
or my other colleagues. My job is to represent the people back home. So um, a lot of them, you know, were, um, and I know they're sincere when uh, they say they're going to miss me, and I say, I'm not going nowhere mm -hmm. because I'll be on different boards. I know how the system works real well. So I'll be calling you. I'm going to be your worst nightmare as a voter. <laughs> I go, oh, no. Well, I wanted to ask you about camaraderie. You've kind of alluded to it. Um, is there camaraderie in the house? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I stated that in my going away remarks. You know, we could be on the House floor, Republicans and Democrats, and battling away on different issues that we don't agree on. But when it's all said and done, we can all leave, go out to dinner, and that day is over. You know, because we fight for what we believe in, what our districts are all about. And again, tragedy has hit so many times since I have been here. And it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. I have never seen 203 members just come together and help with that tragedy. Can you talk about um, your most important pieces of legislation that you've sponsored? Some may not have gotten passed, but what were your issues? The one piece of legislation that I did get passed was the stalking legislation. And this all began uh, the, with uh, teenagers. They were all friends. And uh, one girl really liked the other, one of the boys in the group. and. Uh, another girl liked that boy. And you know how when, when you're teenagers, when you kids, how you all hung around together, boys and girls, you're all friends, you go to football games, all this stuff. That's how it all started until one uh, girl just went really crazy. And she started stalking this girl from at school at work, her home, and we had nothing in the books. Uh, they went to the district magistrates. Uh, stalking wasn't considered any kind of, so what? So someone's a well, big deal type of thing. It ended up, uh, one of the kids in the group called the mother that morning, identified herself as a principal of the school, and they wanted her to come in, they wanted to talk to her. So the mother didn't think anything of it. And before that, the parents went through every legal thing. They did all the right stuff. In the meantime, and they lived in a rural part of Pennsylvania, the principal really didn't call. But the mother leaves and wakes up her daughter to go to school and she says, I have to go to school early because the principal wants to see me. In the meantime, two individuals, the two girls and a boy, broke into this girl's uh, bedroom and slashed her neck till she bled to death. They're both in prison now. As a matter of fact, the one girl in my area is serving her time. And... That just literally just grabbed me when I said, here's kids. And there was nothing we could do to prevent that. So I introduced the legislation, and it was at a time when Governor Casey was sick and Mark Single was the acting governor at the time. And Mark Single signed that piece of legislation. Uh, I couldn't have been happier. And I had the, the mother of the daughter there. 
and um, it, it, the only people that objected was the police. And I did go to our local police, educated them on the bill, because that's every time a new bill is passed, it's up to the district attorney to go to the police station. Here's another bill. Da, 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 da. The police uh, were kind of upset with me and told me I was making more paperwork for them. This is not such a big deal. Just like PFAs when we did them. The police didn't like that either. And we changed that law, which is a lot better than what it was. <coughs> so I, I did my spell to all three shifts. Uh, and the way it's done is they have like papers on the walls and here's the new legislation. I found that police officers were just signing their name but not reading the legislation or because they just thought, because it isn't an easy uh, topic to deal with, domestic violence, and it is becoming more and more with children against their parents than ex-husbands or former boyfriends or whatever. So um, it's always, you know, matter of paperwork. It takes a long time. It's very emotional, and I understood that. But I also told them as police officers, they are responsible for the safety of their community, even though they might have thought, you know, big deal. Mm -hmm. So that I'm very proud of. I think you also brought many other social issues to the forefront by introducing them to the House, at least in the form of resolutions, such as AIDS, Crime Victims Rights Week, Domestic Violence Awareness Week, Women and Addictions Awareness, Mental Illness and Sexual Assault. Yeah. Would you like to comment on any of those? I mean, every year it it's, seems like you're out there yeah. reminding people. And you have to. It has to be consistent. And what I found was no one really pays attention until it happens to them or a family member. Then all of a sudden they join our pack. And I think that's part of human nature. But these are diseases we're talking about that don't need to uh, occur in the lives of Pennsylvanians. Mm -hmm. So I've been you know, very proud to do that both here and in Harrisburg and at home. I mean, we had thousands of capital rallies and I also work with uh, MAD and the Students Against Drunk Drivers. Uh, they all come down to Harrisburg, these, these students, and they just amaze me. Because, you know, the media likes to label our young people all the time. You know, if a young person um, brings marijuana to school and gets caught, they're on TV every day. See what's happening to our kids? Look at how no good they are. This one had, had a photo. See how good they are. And I found out when we're honoring our young people for something, even in my district, the press never even shows up. They make it look like all of our kids are bad. No. There's a percentage, just like there's a percentage of legislators that get in trouble, percentage of everything. But our kids, uh, when they would come down here for the rally, because I had the keg legislation, and they were phenomenal. And, you know, for young kids, and to take this heat from a lot of their peers talking about drinking and driving and binging. Our colleges are just, you know, you can't even feel safe with sending your child to college today because of what's out there, what they get away with. So I was very proud to make some changes, you know, in those pieces of legislation. Did you ever get frustrated? <laughs> oh, every single day. 
I had, and, and as I said earlier, you know, I was the type of person that very organized, and everything that's on my schedule for that day, I do, took off, throw it away, start the new day. I think the most uh, frustrating thing is this, and I stated this earlier, you know, oh, we're going to go into session at 3, and we go in at 7. I truly believe if there were women in power, just like we're going to see Nancy Pelosi, and I'm going to be watching her closely because she's another one of my, uh, she's just a great lady. I was able to meet with her several times at conferences. That if women were in charge, we would be down here working Monday to Friday, 8 to 5, or 9 to 5, just like everybody else does, in the light of day, and we would get things done. But in a male-dominated general assembly, there's no time. There's, uh, they don't operate by a clock, okay? And sometimes I think because they just don't want to go back home. So what's the big difference, you know? Uh, we can deal with these issues. I find in committee meetings, now we might have been debating and debating, you know, let's let this bill out. The guys would go, you know, I, 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 I just think we need to study this more. And at one meeting, and my chairman got me on this, I said, you know what? We've been studying this issue for a damn year now. Get off the pot and vote. Women, I find, are so different. Okay, we can sit down, discuss that issue. Should it be left out? Should it be moved to the floor or whatever? And take a vote. Bills sit in committees for two, just like, you know, any bill that, doesn't pass by next week, you start all over again. I truly believe that if women were in charge, we would have that. We would not have what you call this sigh and die at the end of a legislative session because we would take care of this stuff. If we say we're breaking, we'll be back at 3 o'clock, you can bet your ass we'll be on the floor at 3 o'clock, not 7 and that's the, the frustrating part for me, and I know some of my women colleagues. You know, they go, this is just such a waste. We could be doing this. We could be doing that. And the guys, it's like, <laughs> and believe me, I'm not criticizing them. I love them all. They have good intentions. Uh, but I still believe that they can be retrained, and I tried to do that for 14 years. So I made a little bit of progress even though there was a lot of resistance and I can probably not say how I made the progress in getting them to deal a little bit better with legislation. <laughs> well let me ask you this. Um, there's a lot of opportunities now with this last election. Well the primary and the general. Yeah. Do you see any women rising up? maybe to leadership post, both in the House, the Senate. We do have, uh, I believe Kathy Mandarino is one that is going to be running for leadership, and she was in my class. And I ran for leadership twice, by the way, to prove a point. And it was only my second term, and leadership had their whole slate, and, I had hats that said LBJ, and I, and I always remember feed them that works, gave them all candy bars, did this whole nine yards. Obviously, and I first asked any senior woman member uh, if they had any intentions of running. No, and they'd been here like 16, 17 years. And I was only here for four. And I said, 
I just think we need to send a message that it's okay. Because I'm tired of this seniority crap down here. That it's okay if women run for leadership. We need to open the door for that. So I did. Uh, obviously, I lost both times. But the first time, there were three of us running. And so the two guys that were fighting for it needed my nine votes. So I was in power for like 45 minutes. So that kind of felt cool, you know. Uh, I think some of the women are, they think, you know, when I came down here and anything that we had to go to the leadership, I was always the spokesperson. They would say, oh, no, can you go because you know how to get the message across. Now, I don't think, I don't know if they were afraid to go to leadership, to complain about things, that uh, their life would be miserable, or they were looked upon as whiny women. You know, hey, you wanted to come down here. This is the way it is. This is the way the atmosphere is. Deal with it. Well, I wasn't one of those. You know, if there was a problem, I went right to my leadership, screamed, yelled, carried on. And he was excellent with me because he'd rather give me what I want than to hear me screaming and yelling at him. So I, I used, you know, whatever tools that men have used and in a different way. And when it came to legislation, and especially when it was legislation on uh, AIDS, drug and alcohol, domestic violence, you know, the, you know, the media was so, besides here and at home, if it had anything to do with economic development and taxes, they'd go interview one of my male colleagues back home. Now, if it had anything to do with AIDS, domestic violence, they come to me because that's how they classify us. Because after all, women know nothing about economic development uh, or about business. You know, we only raised a family and worked and uh, balanced budgets, but you know, that's how they would interview us. And I had uh, friends in the media, young females, that always got the job. And I said, hey, let me ask you something. You know, how is this decided that you would interview me? Just about the same way as we as legislators. They'll look, they'll go, okay, Mary, you're going to go interview LBJ, but, and you have nothing to say about it. The female reporters are treated the same way. The male reporters are the ones that go see the male legislators for economic development, taxes, and so forth. And that still uh, sticks today. But um, it, it, it's just interesting, you know, how it, it, it truly works down here. But uh, the guys, I would always have a hard time getting them to co-sponsor one of my uh, bills that to them just didn't seem, okay? So what I did is what the guys always did. You know, I'd go up to them oh, my God, that tie is so, I mean, it brings out the blue in your eyes. Oh, well, really? Oh, right. and they'd go, Oh, my daughter got me this tie for Christmas, and I'm just wearing it because my daughter got it. I said, oh, no. Then the guys would start wearing, like, bright color shirts. That they, you know, it was always black suit, white shirt, black tie, red tie, blue tie, that's it. So I would just, uh, t oh, because, you know, they, the guys needed to be pampered. So... After I would do that, and they'd go, okay, now, LBJ, what's this bill about? And I had them. Had them eating on my hands. And that's how the men have treated it for women all this time. So I kind of 
found a way to reverse it, even to the point where they got a new haircut. <laughs> it got ridiculous. But I had to do what I had to do to survive down here. Mm -hmm. What do you think the hardest issue is before the legislature right now? I think the hardest issue uh, is this property tax issue. You know, we've been talking about it for so long. Governor Rendell has campaigned on it. We better produce it. Because I know my last campaign, uh, property taxes and health care were the two biggest issues that I heard from my constituents. And to this day, we still don't have it. And we better see it. Just like on a federal level, even though the Democrats have taken control of both houses, I hope they realize the responsibility that they have. Not that they just, you know, yeah, people wanted to change. Well, when the Democrats are in charge, they better sit down and think of how they're going to change it. And those were the two biggest issues that I have always, always heard about. Two uh, pieces of legislation that are still pending in the, in the committee that I was hoping would get done before I left. And so now I'm looking at my uh, replacement as being prime sponsors, and that's universal health care. Uh, we've gotten a wonderful response on this piece of legislation. The other piece of legislation is the Open Records Adoption Bill. And I think we have another prime sponsor on both sides of the aisle that will continue my fight for that. So that makes me feel good. During your 14 years of service, you were a m member of numerous committees. Can you tell us a little bit about your committee service and which ones you enjoyed the most? I enjoyed all of them. Uh, and even back home, because I, uh, I was the caucus secretary for military veterans affairs. And in my district, this was before redistricting, I had the soldiers and sailors home in my district. And I just loved going to see those guys. Most of them have no family members and they'd look at me as their girlfriend or their granddaughter and you would just listen to their stories. And of course because my daughter was a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy um, trauma nurse, uh, I learned so much from her. And I, that committee was a must for me to be on. And I am so glad that my leadership kept me on that committee the whole 14 years. The other uh, committee, the insurance committee and the House, uh, the Health and Welfare, I felt those two committees worked hand in hand. And everyone says we have a health care problem in Pennsylvania. And I continue to say we need insurance reform in Pennsylvania, not health care. Health care is fine. But you look at these insurance industries and whether it's health, whether it's automobile, I don't care what kind of insurance it is, mm -hmm. it is way out of line. So these two really you know, for me, work together on the issues that were near and dear to my constituents and myself. In your opinion, what are the biggest technological advances that you've witnessed since you've been here? I think one of the, the biggest ones was our laptop computers. Now, because we have members here that have been here for 25, 30 years, and I can remember Matt Ryan, former Speaker of the House, saying, we're going to have computers. He scratched his foot. Uh-uh, I ain't doing it, I ain't doing it, I ain't doing it. So it started out with uh, like 10 members on a trial process, and then 
another 10 members, another 10 members. And it's very simple, the computer's on our desk, because it's a rolling session and so forth. But as uh, former Speaker Ryan indicated to all of us, this is for legislative business only. And in the past, we've had some problems, you know. That, I, I think that was one of the funniest and the newest, uh, you know, technologies from the time I started here. Just the thought of computer just drove them over the edge, just over the edge when you talk about technical things. And I think also the improvements we have done uh, just here in, in broadcasting and uh, folks like yourself coming in here and interviewing different uh, lawmakers as they leave this wonderful institution that we didn't have before. You have to constantly be upgrading everything or you're lost. Uh, blackberries, you know, nobody knew what a blackberry was. It's those those things that do cost money, but if we need all the resources, the technical resources, to get our messages across, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. I mean, my niece and, and, and nephew and Ah, there are five or six. I go down there, out there on a computer. They know everything. Mm -hmm. And they're going to need that for the next century, believe me. Well, we talked about technology. What were some of the other changes that you've witnessed? Oh, let's see. You know, besides the computers and... The, oh, one of the other things, too, I think, uh, is allowing the media to be on the floor uh, and generally you know they're given permission a, a station for 15 minutes 20 minutes and it's funny at the same time and again I don't mean to be sexist but it's the men when the speaker announces that Joe Johnson from KDKQR will be filming the guy doing their eyebrows and stuff. The women were just sitting there, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a, uh, uh, a new one. I have always, um, and, and to this point, I don't know if I support televised um, sessions, when I watch the federal government and I see, and, and most people don't understand when a rep is speaking, and there's nobody there. You know, there's nobody there because they're either doing a resolution or they're doing a, a, a special uh, thing they want done for the record. People get so confused. Well, how come so is there? Don't they care? Da, 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 da then some of the things that can be seen are just not the type of things that should be seen. There is a conduct on that house floor, and that conduct should remain. And I think a lot of times you see some things that aren't so nice. So I'm still, I believe in educating the people out there but yet I'm still concerned about it. Like in my district, we don't have PCN. Yeah, you know, we have it around the state lot. We don't have it. Uh, a lot of people have asked me how, how come I haven't fought for PCN in my district? And I said, because I don't want you to see what goes on. It's, I'm just being honest with you. Because I think, you know, as a, a young person that got involved in politics, I looked at, uh, especially senators, congressmen, house members, to act in a professional manner. 
And I think as soon as you see them, and yes, we're all human beings, you know, like uh, like I, I, when I would go talk about my alcohol problem and I would be the last person to think that I would be a state rep, yes, we're all human. We all make mistakes. But I think when you're on that house floor, it's just very important to conduct yourself in a professional manner. And we don't see that down here. So I, I just still leery about the PCN coming in my district. Have you noticed that as a change? Or has it always been, the behavior has always been about the same? Oh, yeah. Oh, Oh, it's even worse. I think it's worse since I came down here. Um, if you watch the sessions, you'll see Speaker Ryan constantly pounding the gavel. Members get in your seats or leave the House floor if you're having conversation. Now, when the public sees the conversation, they don't think it's legislative. They think, oh, well, they're talking about where they're going to eat tonight. Da, 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 da. And 99% of the time, those conversations are legislative. I have done that. I have had to uh, leave my seat and talk to different members explaining why I need their support. But perception is everything. And when the public isn't told beforehand, they sit there and they go, what? They're not even listening. They're not. And I try and explain to them, both sides have caucuses. We caucus on this legislation. Well, if you do, then you should just get on the House floor and just vote on it. Why all the shenanigans? And they're exactly right. And this is where all the waste of time is. Do you have a fondest memory of serving? Oh, I have so many. The people, like I said earlier, the, the staff is who I'm going to miss, but I'm also going to miss, you know, all my colleagues, uh, whether I've had battles with them or not. One particular, and a Republican, by the way, it was in the winter, and where my office is in the Irvis building, I could come out those doors and, and walk by the fountain and just get right in instead of taking the elevator. Because when you do that, I'm always late for a meeting because you're running into this one, that one, that one. So I could go straight outside and avoid all that. And it was uh, very wintry, icy, cold winter day. And I was walking with another colleague, and before I knew it, <coughs> I slipped on ice and hit my head and passed out. I never passed out in my life. One of my colleagues who's in the same building, who was a Republican, it still is, happened to be looking out his window and seeing me fall. He ran down the steps and take the elevator. Ran down the steps, and there he was. Because my friend was so upset, and she said, "Oh, oh, oh! Are you dead? Are you dead? I don't hear. I never passed out in my life." And this guy literally, you know, sat on that ice and snow. Waited till I finally woke up, and they called the uh, doctor, nurse, or whoever they called. And he was just incredible. And I couldn't believe it. This, this is what I'm trying to stress. You know, you, you hear the public always saying that, uh, now in Washington, that's a whole different environment. But when you hear, oh, yeah, it's so partisan here. When it comes to human issues and taking care of one another. Now, it would have been very easy 
He's seen another colleague was with me. Oh, I'll be safe past that. But he ran down those steps. And to this day, we just talk about it all. I, I thank him and thank him every day. He tells me I don't have to. And I said, but I do. But I do. So that is, you know, one of my most, I guess, sincere fondest memories. Uh, one memory that was kind of hilarious, and that was on because guys were pressing my buttons. But I had a piece of legislation on prostate cancer. And uh, I was debating the issue because you know, when you have prostate cancer, you can be treated, your insurance company pays for it. Ninety-eight percent of men after treatment are found impotent. And there's a treatment to take care of that. But the insurance companies won't pay for that treatment. You know, that's like saying we as women go get a mammogram and it gets paid for. But then if it comes back positive, they're not going to pay for that continued treatment. Well, then what's the sense in having these tests done? And I guess it was my words that I used on the house floor or whatever and got them all tuned up. And, but it was a fun thing. I did get yelled at by Speaker Purcell. He reminded me that we were on TV. And I didn't know what I did wrong. I said, you know, I know you're hearing all this stuff from my guys and they're agitating. But, Mr. Speaker, this is a serious subject. And I don't know why you have to say to me that we're on TV and I should watch what I say. So it just goes to show where your mind is, along with the rest of the guys down here. Because it is. It's a very serious subject problem. So that's one of the the nicer ones, one of the more human, uh, humorous ones, you know. Mm -hmm. What aspect of your job did you enjoy the most? Uh, just being with my people, uh, going to all their functions, and my legislative seat uh, has the most churches of all of uh, the Erie delegation. So I could be going to four spaghetti dinners in one day and pancake breakfast and then when it's lunch time, all those things. But I love it because you get an opportunity to hear from those people face to face. And you know, some people, well after a couple of years they knew they come to me with anything. Sometimes half the things I heard I wish I wouldn't have heard. But some people are afraid. If you go in, if a state rep goes into a dinner or something and they, they want to uh, talk to their state rep, but yet they feel like they're intimidated, that they can't go talk to them. When you're in this sort of social environment, they feel better about it. And uh, I have uh, enjoyed it. I know my brothers and sisters would say, how can you be in Harrisburg all week, come home the whole weekend, you're at all these functions, and you turn around and you go back to Harrisburg. And I said, if I wasn't out in the community, I wouldn't know the pulse of the community because that's the only way you get to know your community. Mm -hmm. is by talking to the people one by one. And that's generally what I do in the summer when we're not here in session is uh, I go to my different businesses, uh, nonprofit organizations to see what's going on. How are they doing? What are the outcomes of some of the programs? So I will miss that, but I'm still going to be on a couple of those boards, so I'll be alive and well. We'll get back to that in a second. Okay. What aspect did you not like? And I think I said this before, the, the frustration down here 
that I feel is not needed. Uh, if you're going to be ch in charge down here, you have to have some kind of a system. There is no way we should be doing legislation at 2 or 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. or going that 24-hour cycle because all that does is wear and tear on all of us rank-and-file members that it gets to the point we don't care. Whatever it is, we'll vote on it. That is not the way to do business in Harrisburg. So what are your future plans? Everybody asked me that, and even in my, at my going away speech, because everybody was at, well, back home here. <laughs> so to shut everybody up, I said, um, I'm going to get married and have a family. <laughs> oh, you should have heard all that. Uh, I plan on first, uh, in the winter, I'm going to San Diego. My daughter lives in San Diego. I'll never get to see her from there, Arizona. Florida. That's where I'm going to be in the winter. Then I'm going to come back home. I'm going to remain on four boards that deal with all the issues that we discussed earlier. And I'm going to be very active in politics. I told everyone I'm not going away. I will be everyone's worst nightmare. Well, how would you like your tenure to be remembered? Probably that I tried to make a difference in people's lives. Whether it, it could have been just one person, but I truly made a difference. That's what I came down here to do. Uh, it isn't easy. I think when you first get elected, you have all these goals. You forget you have 202 other people to deal with. And, uh, but I would, I would just like to be remembered as somebody that uh, was honest, uh, that truly listened, and just truly cared about the people. Do you have any advice for new members that will be starting soon? And I think I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, and now that uh, I know the gentleman that's going to replace me, I have met with him several, several times, and it won't sink in until he actually gets here, just like it was with me. But it's just like what I told him when he was running. It isn't in your heart, your gut, your head. Don't even think about doing it. Because if it's in all those three places, you're going to win. Sure, you're going to have problems. You're going to wonder where that next dollar comes from. But if you strongly believe in what you're doing, you'll do it. Because no one else is going to do it for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This, this was fun. This concludes our interview. Thank you.